Well, we're going to take a, a little diversion. We're at the very end of the book of John. We literally have one chapter left, John 21. Um, but we're not going to do John 21 today because in the Italian service we had a guest speaker. So I'm going to do a message from John, but actually out of 1 John. Um, it'll be on the coattails of one that we looked at uh, some months back about love. John, 1 John 4, um, 7 and 8 is kind of uh, one of the go-to passages that speaks about love. And we're going to review that and then go a little further, a couple verses in. Um, but this all interconnects with the, the gospel of John that we've been studying and in Jesus' life. And probably, Lord willing, next week we'll finish the book. Um, we've seen the, the resurrection, and then Peter will be restored in that last chapter, and we'll see that next week, Lord willing. So I wanted to review with you, this is the, the two verses before what we're going to look at, and it gives us, kind of sets the stage. Uh, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And so if you remember the difference between uh, the audience of the Gospel of John and 1 John is John was writing in the Gospel of John to specifically tell people how to know Jesus, how to trust Jesus. You think of John 3.16. His Gospel was written to tell us how to know and enter into relationship with Christ. But 1 John, he had another purpose. It was to tell us and speak to us about being intimate with Jesus, not just trusting him for the first time, but going deeper and knowing Jesus personally. And so that's a lot of what 1 John is about. Um, we saw, uh, when we looked at this verse before, that the source of all true love is God. That love doesn't just describe God, but that he is love. He is the author of love. And that true love, that love that the Bible calls agape, um, it comes from him. And we looked at the nature of this love of God. Okay, so we talked about some of the Greek words that, that are used to describe different forms of love. We talked about um, eros, which is a, a physical love, has to do with the body. It typically tends to be a selfish love and has the mindset of just receiving gratification. Philos is another word uh, used in, in, the, in the New Testament, has to do with the soul and is, is an emotional uh, love. It's giving and receiving, kind of a friendship love. Philadelphia, the word comes from Philos, the city of brotherly love. We affectionately call it the city of brotherly shove because the folks in Philadelphia aren't so friendly. <laughs> but you get the idea. So this is, this is the level of typical human love, right? You give a little, you receive a little bit, and everybody's happy. But then there's agape, a love that, it's a spiritual love, and it's not so much a love of feelings. It's not that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's a a love of the will. It's a decision. Um, and it's completely selfless and is only interested in giving. And the unique thing we saw about this type of love, this agape love, humans of themselves cannot produce this type of love. There's always a selfish element in our human love. But God can produce this in us if we've trusted in Christ. The Spirit can produce this love in us. But we on our own are not capable of that selfless, pure love. Um, we saw that agape, in the life of a believer, God's love, he loves us with this perfect, flawless love, selfless love, and it should be the foundation of every other love relationship in our life. Eros, in the context of a marriage, philos, in the context of fellowship in the body, are great within the confines that God uh, provided, and then specifically when they're built on his love, right? Humanity, at best, experiences eros and philos apart from God. Without a relationship with Christ, that agape love we can't produce, and we exist in this human realm of love that is only interested in giving and taking. Um, and we talked about how Oftentimes, relationships get built this way and are built upon physical attraction and some friendship, and things don't work out typically very well when you have that as 
think of a, a pyramid upside down, not very stable, um, that this would be the model uh, for a believer to build all relationships on this perfect love of Christ. So we saw in uh, this first passage that the most powerful manifestation of intimacy with God is love. If I'm close to Jesus, I can't help but love well like Jesus loves, right? So what he shared here, an important thing to kind of a little parenthesis to the side, 1 John, when it's taught many times in the evangelical church, I think it's taught in a, in a spirit that is not what John's heart was for the passage. Many times it's taught as a list of uh, tests to see if someone is a believer. That's not what John is getting at with his book in 1 John. He, he's actually helping us to understand, are we intimate with Jesus? He assumes that people that he's writing to in 1 John are already believers. And so he says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So people who are loving with this agape love, they're born of God, they've trusted Christ, and they know God. They're intimate with God. And then he says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So we know that the world obviously can't love this way, can't love with this agape love. But there are times when we as believers struggle to love with agape love. I don't know about you, but there are plenty of days at home when I don't have God's agape love for my wife and my family, especially when the kids are going crazy. And it comes from when I'm distant from the Lord. When I'm away from Him, I don't produce His agape love in any realm of my life. So a great gauge of my intimacy with the Lord is, am I loving like he does? If I'm not, it probably tells me that I'm distant from the Lord and I need to, to draw closer to him. So that's the context for the next two verses that we're going to look at. And I wanted to ask you a couple of opening questions, a little discussion um, as we think about this topic. So we read... Uh, 1 John 4, 9 through 11, by this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What comes to mind when you hear, we ought to love one another? Good, bad, or ugly? What comes to mind? You should have done. <laughs> yeah, that ought. ought. <laughs> that, that pokes me. We should, we ought. We don't like those, those types of phrases. So for you guys, who are the most difficult people for you to love? Let's just be honest. Yeah, absolutely. People of the opposite political party, right? Sometimes family's the hardest. <laughs> we won't mention any names, right? <laughs> Maybe not even, I mean, you think of the classic mother-in-law, right? I have a wonderful mother-in-law, but um, a lot of people say, it's hard to love my mother-in-law. What... Um, what have you tried in the past to help you love others better? What, what techniques have you used? Does anything come to mind? I try to see the world from their perspective. Yeah, sure. It helps <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. Or at least to understand, maybe not to agree. Yeah. Just, just to see what sure, sure. Anything else that you think of that comes to mind? Try to look who they are and what they're doing. Yes. Yes. That does help. Absolutely. So perspective. Both of those things kind of deal with our perspective, stepping back. Absolutely. So we ask ourselves, why do we struggle so much to love one another? And, and not just loving people outside the church, but even in the church. It's sometimes really, really hard to love other believers. It's not like, oh, it's just hard to love people that are very strange and different from us in the world, but within the church. 
Um, we know we should love, um, but we struggle with it. Uh, and if we say that we don't struggle with love, we're self-deceived, right? I mean, <laughs> if we're honest, you know, at the core, um, on some level, our love, apart from God's help, is always tainted with self, right? Everything, even the purest forms of love we can think of in the world are still tainted with some self-interest. Um, and we as believers even sometimes see loving one another as a burden, as an obligation. Um, and truly, our resources and ourselves are insufficient to love as God wants us to love. We don't have the capacity to do what he's asking us to do without him. And we're going to see that kind of fleshed out in these couple of verses. I think the, the nugget, the, the summary of these, these three verses would be, how should we respond to God's breathtakingly deep love for us? What should be our response to the crazy way that God has shown his love for us? Um, and I think in these two verses we're going to see how the, this extraordinary manifestation of God's love for us, it leaves us in awe, it transforms us, and it can motivate us to share that love with others. Um, but let's, let's look at the text. It's short. I want to start with verse 10. We'll come back to, to 9. He says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So when he says in this, he's talking about in, the, in this that God loved us. This is his agape love, his perfect love. Um, God gave us Jesus. He sent his son, and he gives us Jesus without demands for reciprocation. God gives and doesn't demand anything in return. Now, we know the nature of human love is that we're always looking for some, think of the philos and eros, we're always looking for some reciprocation. Think about every relationship in your life, from, from your marriage relationship to children, if you always give and never get any love back, that's not going to last long, right? It's going to fall apart. That's just how, we're, how we operate in the human realm. Um, if you're only always giving, the relationships won't, won't last for very long. Um, and, and truthfully, if I'm honest with myself, sometimes I give because I want to receive, not because I have the best interest at heart of those that I'm, I'm loving. Sometimes I love because I want to be loved back, not because I just have a heart for that person. And that's, so there's a level of manipulation in self many times when I love. I mean, I, I think maybe the closest human approximation to God's love would be a mother's love for her children. As close as we could possibly get, right? It's a, a relatively selfless love. Um, but only believers who have God's spirit inside can love with God's selfless agape love. Even a mother on her best day, when what seems like completely pure love, there are still selfish motives. But in God's spirit, we can produce this agape love, this selfless love. He goes on and says, um, in this is love, not that we loved God. God's love, God is always the initiator with love. Paul tells us, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us when we were his enemies. He always takes the first step. God always steps towards us first with love. And then, and 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. The truth is, if God hadn't initiated love with us, we never would have responded to him. Had he not taken the first step towards us, sending his son, we would never have responded to him. That's sobering, but it's very true. I don't know if any of you have ever read a poem by a man named Francis Thompson called The Hound of Heaven. And it's, and it's a little bit of a morbid poem, but it speaks about how God's love is so relentless and chases after us like a hound. This was a summary that I read that really 
summarize this idea of who God is, talking about this poem. The name is strange, the hound of heaven. It startles one at first. It's so bold, so new, so fearless. It does not attract, rather the reverse. But when one reads the poem, this strangeness disappears. The meaning is understood. As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing nearer to the chase, with unhurrying and unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. And though in sin or in human love, away from God it seeks to hide itself, divine grace follows after, unwearyingly follows ever after, till the soul feels its pressure, forcing it to turn to him alone in that never-ending pursuit. The idea, and, and one of the refrains in this poem is, God follows after, follows after. He chases our hearts. He wants to enter into a love relationship with us, but we run away. And some of us even have stories of literally running away from God. Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms that we learn as kids. And this is the last part of it. Surely your goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all my days. And I will live in the Lord's house for the rest of my life. Um, this, this verb in the Hebrew, translated pursue, means to chase or to persecute. It's typically used describing an enemy, how an enemy would chase you or persecute you. But it's saying God's love will chase us, run us down, persecute us in a positive sense. It runs us over. It overwhelms us. So... The author uses a, a negative verb that normally would be used of an enemy to speak of God's love chasing after us. Even when we're running away from him, he's still following us. Yeah, it's incredible. And I think each of us could speak to how we've seen him chasing after us even as we run away and as we're trying to hide from him. So think of, of, of for those of you who have trusted Christ, um, when you did that, some of us remember the day and the time. Others, we just know it happened when we were young at some point. And we don't, I don't remember exactly when it happened. I just know when I was five or six, I trusted the Lord with my parents. Um, we know that it wasn't a whim. We didn't just wake up one day and say, today's a good day to trust Jesus. If we think about it, if we really notice the details, God had probably been pursuing us for a long time. It wasn't like, oh, well, today's a good day. I'm going to trust Jesus and, and have my, I'm going to be born again today. Now, occasionally, someone will, will respond quickly to a gospel presentation. But truthfully, probably even behind that, God had been chasing after them and working on their hearts and pursuing them for years. So it's encouraging, even looking at our own testimonies, that we know God had pursued each of us individually first before we believed. But if there's anyone here that hasn't trusted Christ, the fact that you're here means that he's pursuing. He's, he's chasing after you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And we shouldn't resist, right? We should say, yes, I believe. I trust you. He uses a big word. Propitiation. This is love. Not that God loved us, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I had to look up all that that means because I didn't know. has two ideas. The idea of satisfaction. God's anger. God has righteous and just anger towards us as sinners. We have violated his law, his truth. We've done wrong. We've done evil. He has righteous anger towards us. So Jesus, his blood, satisfies that anger and that wrath. When we trust in Jesus, God's wrath is pacified. It's satisfied. So that's one aspect. But then it goes beyond that. It's not just that God's not angry anymore, but that Jesus reconciles us back to God. It restores the relationship. When I trust in Jesus, God's wrath is satisfied, and my relationship is restored with him. I can be intimate with the God of the universe because of what Jesus did. So propitiation satisfies God's wrath and provides reconciliation, bringing two parties that were separated by sin together in relationship. 
So this agape love that we've talked about is sacrificial in nature. Uh, it costs to love this way. And I think those of us that have, have, have walked with the Lord and have um, experienced his agape love and been used by God to show this agape love know that it, it's costly. It's not an easy love to show. Um, I heard a story of a son who asked his dad, well, if God loved us so much, why didn't he come himself? Why did he, why did he send his son? Why didn't God the Father come himself? You can imagine an eight or nine-year-old, the wheels turning in his brain and going, asking this question. And the father thought for a little bit, and he said, well, let me, let me put it in perspective for me. It would be much easier, son, for me to, to give my life for you uh, than for me to offer your life for someone else. That would be devastating to me. He said, son, uh, if there was a, a need, I would gladly give my life to save you. You're, you're my precious son. But if I had to give your life to save others, that's unthinkable. I wouldn't give up my son to save especially enemies of mine. That's exactly the measure of love. Gives us a perspective of the greatness of God the Father's love that he gave his one and only son for us, his enemies. So let's go back to verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. By this, the love of God was manifested because God sent his only begotten son into the world. Um, I think of an ex a practical example. One of my seminary professors who just recently passed away, his name was Walt Baker. He and his, his wife... Uh, they left Dallas. They had, he had been serving the Lord, had gone, gone through seminary and was teaching. He left for the mission field to go to Haiti. And he and his wife lived for 10 years in a corrugated tin shed serving the people of Haiti and sharing the gospel and loving them. And I think of that as a, on some small level, an, an, an idea of that, that love of Christ being Walt Baker and his wife being sent to share the gospel with the Haitians. And in the same sense, Jesus Christ was sent by the Father to come down from the glories of heaven, sent to come down to live among the grit and the sweat and the mess of earth. Jesus gave up the glories of heaven to come down and be amongst us. And I think on a practical level, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to sit at the right hand of the Father, to be in glory, but then to come down and to deal with, with headaches and hunger and constipation and all the different things that go with the human condition, right? Jesus went from limitless glory that we can't even imagine, became flesh, and lived with all of the mess that you and I lived with. And he did that to be obedient to his Father. Paul tells us a little bit about that. Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We can feel the weight of God's love for us in his sacrificing of his son, sending him to the mission field here. And he says that we might live through him. This was the goal of Jesus' death and resurrection, that we might live through him. Not just that we would have eternal life by trusting in him, but eternal life doesn't have to wait until heaven. The idea is that now, today, we would live through him, this life, this eternal life that would begin now. It's not just that when we die, we have an eternity waiting for us, but that he wants us to begin that eternal life now, living through him. And then the final verse, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There's that ought. So we know that God initiated love with us. And so we are called to initiate love with others. 
God took the first step with us, and now he's calling us to take that step with others. Uh, and this is not a have to love that is obligated by God's love. It's not that, well, God loved us. All right, we got to love. Let's grit our teeth and pull up our bootstraps and, and hunker down. We're going to love because God loved it. Well, we just got to do it too. That's not the idea at all. Um, in the new covenant, when we trust in Christ, the spirit comes to live inside of us. And he also gives us the desires, God's heart and God's desires for others. And that means that he actually can make this loving thing a want to. To where I want to live out and love God's agape love for others. It's something that comes from the Holy Spirit. You and I, without the Spirit's help, can't love this way. But this can become a want to. And each of us have experienced this in our walk with the Lord. Not always, but there are moments. Have you noticed that you just spontaneously can't help but love someone near you? It just comes out. It's the Spirit working, moving you to be to love sacrificially. I guess our biggest problem when we think of this, this command, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. We've seen this repeated different times in the New Testament. We can't give what we don't have. We, we have to first let God love on us. We first have to receive his love before we can offer it to anyone else. You think about your, your, your car fuel tanker. If you have an electric car, your car's battery. They have to be charged or your tank has to have fuel in it for your vehicle to go, right? You're not going to get anywhere if your tank is empty. Think about that on a spiritual level. If I have not let the Lord fill me spiritually with his love, what do I have to offer anyone else? If I'm bankrupt spiritually, I'm not walking intimately with the Lord, letting him love me, I don't have much to offer anyone else. And I see this all the time at home. I'll get spiritually dry. And if I haven't been intimate with the Lord, my tank is empty and I have nothing to offer my family, my wife, my kids. Um, so thinking about how we can apply this, on some level, it's, I guess, to put it simply, we've got to let God refill our love tank. I know that sounds very simplistic. But as we know him, as we walk with him and trust him, live with him experientially in our lives, we see his faithfulness, we see his love over time, and we can look back and we know his truth intellectually. We see what the word says. It tells us that he loves us. And we experience that love. As we draw close to the Lord through experience in life and through the truth of his word, we feel our love tank full. Um, one of the things to remember is we draw close to the Lord. Um, he's not asking us to get our act together before we come and feel loved. He's offering his love before we've fixed anything or before he's even fixed anything. He loves us and he accepts us before anything's been changed. That's the incredible thing, that he knows everything about you and me, all of our secrets, all of our skeletons in the closet, and loved us and accepted us first. He offers that even before we've trusted his son, right? Right? Once we trust his son and become a part of his family, the spirit comes to live inside of us. He changes us. The beautiful thing about God's love, which is perfect, is God is not capable of loving in varying degrees. You and I, maybe one minute we're loving real well and we're feeling the warm fuzzies and the next minute it's like, it's not happening. Our feelings are up and down all over. God's love is constant, perfect. When I'm faithful to him, here. When I'm failing him, here. His love does not change with my behavior. We can't comprehend that because I imagine when I am not treating my wife well, her love for me is probably waning. She's frustrated. She's anger. And when I'm treating her real well, maybe it's high. 
God's love isn't like that. It's constant. He's not capable of loving less. He always loves perfectly. That's hard for us to imagine. So let's not think that we need to get anything corrected or fixed before we come to him. He's in the business of life transformation. He can do that through the spirit in us. We don't have to get everything adjusted before we come and receive his love. And then final thing, um, we're designed to be channels of his love to others. God doesn't love us just to hoard his love. There's always a purpose. You think with God's people in, in the Old Testament, God blessed his, his nation of Israel so that they could be a blessing to others, not so they could hoard what he had given them. And that is the same with his love in our lives. He longs for us to be conduits, channels of his love to others. We need to let him pour in, and then the Bible talks about there will be rivers of living water that will come out of us. The spirit in us will flow out his love if we let him pour in. Otherwise, if we don't let him pour in, love will always be a have to for us. It will always feel like an ought, should. And that's hard, right? Think about the Dead Sea, just an image of this. If you've been to the, the Holy Land, the Dead Sea is very, 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 very highly mineralized. Lots of salt, lots of minerals dissolved to the point where when you, when you lay in it, uh, I remember it felt like oil because it was so mineralized and you float literally on top. Like my body would sink about that much. Just you're floating on top because there's so many minerals that keep you buoyant, which is amazing. It's great for your skin. I mean, I, you know, um, but nothing can live or grow in it. The problem is it is a body of water that only receives water. Water only comes in, comes down from the Jordan River and from some other tributaries, but there's no outflow. There's no water in, water out. And so it's dead. And we think it's cool because of the mineral content and, and its uniqueness, but no fish, no plant life can live in that body of water because it's so mineralized, so salty. It's the same with our lives. If there's not an outflow as God's love pours in, it stagnates if we keep it to ourselves. The purpose and the point of him loving us is that we would be blessed and strong that we might be conduits of that love to others. I wanted to end with a story that it's a secular story from some uh, American history um, that illustrates this, I think, well. Um, sometimes we can find even illustrations in the secular world that, that illustrate spiritual realities. If you remember President Lincoln, uh, many of us have studied the 16th president of the United States. He was the, um, probably the, one of the driving forces to help abolish slavery in the United States back in the 1860s. And when he was young, he was a lawyer before he was president, um, wasn't a prominent lawyer by any stretch. In fact, he had uh, been assigned to an important legal case uh, young in his career as a lawyer. And the, the man who was in charge of this particular case was a man named Edwin Stanton. And Edwin Stanton was a brilliant orator, was a brilliant lawyer. And Lincoln was so bumbling that Stanton said, I don't want to have a gorilla like this on my, on my team. And he dismissed Lincoln from his legal team. Lincoln was pushed off the case. Lincoln, in his humility, he sat down and stayed on and listened to Stanton and his legal argument, which is brilliant. In fact, Lincoln wrote in his diary later that night, he said, Stanton's defense was genius. I'm going to go home and study law all over again. This is a humble, humble man, Lincoln. And so fast forward a bit, Lincoln is now running for president. And Edwin Stanton was one of his primary critics. You can imagine him tweeting if he were uh, the constant stream of criticism. So Stanton was one of his biggest critics. But when Lincoln eventually became president, Lincoln was a wise man, a humble man, a wise man. He saw the wisdom in Edwin Stanton's uh, ca capabilities, and he appointed Edwin Stanton as his secretary of war, an important position in his cabinet. And there was a point where 
um, President Lincoln had uh, uh, given an executive, particular executive order, and Stanton said, he's a fool for giving that order. He published this in the papers. He told this to the media. And, and President Lincoln said, he's right. I rescind that order. So Lincoln was a very humble man and saw something in, in Edwin Stanton um, that was important in terms of his leadership. The night that Abraham Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater, um, who was it that stayed the whole night with him across the street before he died? It was Edwin Stanton. And when President Lincoln passed away that next morning, Stanton announced publicly, the greatest leader in the world has just died. Love has a capacity to melt the hardest heart and transform the most difficult lives. Now this is obviously a, spirit, a, a secular example, but this is exactly what God's love does in us and through us. It's his love that melts our hearts, transforms our hearts and lives, and then makes us a conduit that we can be a channel of his love for others. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we can be your sons and daughters and that we can become channels of your love to others. God, I pray that you would empower us, enable us to receive your love, to let you love on us and to let our hearts be full of the precious love that you have shown for us on the cross, that you show for us daily, that we could receive that, bask in it, enjoy it, and then share it that we would become channels of your love for others, that we would allow your spirit to control us, to empower us, that we could be vessels of your agape, selfless love for the world, that they would see who Jesus is and would want to know him and to trust him. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.